One of the most important aspects of writing is character dialogue. Whether for a book, movie, or video game, you cannot ignore this one. Show versus tell, character voice and cadence, we cover it all. Get ready to learn how to write great dialogue, because class is in session. Hello everyone, I'm Steel. And I'm Teal. And we're with Studio Blue. Thank you for joining us for our Creator Classroom, where tonight we're going to be talking about writing dialogue for stories and games. Oh, right. Hey, thank you. Sounds like we had a, a cheer just now, didn't we? We have Jerry following us. Awesome. We've got, uh, welcome to our stream, Graceless, Griffin, and XP Gained. Great to see everyone here tonight. Um... Uh, that's weird. So someone followed us and we didn't have the yellow brick road? No, it was rather strange. Uh-oh, I'm wondering if Streamlabs is broken. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the stream, everybody. Uh, this is Studio Blue, and we are doing a creator classroom. Tonight, we are going to teach you all uh, the inner and outer workings of writing dialogue for stories and games, as my lovely wife Teal said. Uh, I do apologize in advance if at any point Teal and I slur. We are not drunk. It is hotter than a donkey's butt during the highest points of July. And nothing we have done has been able to fix that. We actually had someone out here earlier today working on the AC, and they were only able to mitigate the problem. Hello, Corrigan. How are you? All right, shall we jump in? Let's jump in. All right. So writing dialogue for stories and games is what we're focusing on tonight. And the purpose of the presentation, Mr. Professor Slime would say, uh, God, it's awful graceless. We are going to showcase the best practices for creating dialogue for both stories and videos, as well as games using examples to illustrate the point. Uh, this is going to be more of a lecture and discussion classroom and less of uh, a workshop. <clears throat> we are going to split this into two pieces. The first part, Steel, myself, will be presenting writing dialogues for narratives like books and novels and short stories. Then we're going to take a quick BRB, shuffle, 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 and Teal will pick up writing dialogues for video games, because it's one of the things she actually excels very well in. Yep. <clears throat> Welcome to the stream, Reverie. Hey, Reverie, how are you doing? All right, so let's just get right into the meat of it. As usual with any creator classroom, if you have a question and you want to address me directly, I am looking at the monitor here and I can see you. Please let me know what you have to ask or comments that you want to add. If you want to make just general commentary or want to address Teal, she's in the director's booth, she can see you as well. Shall we begin, my love? Let's begin. Let's do it. So, dialogue and stories. Right. So, there are seven writing points for you to follow whenever you want to write a dialogue for, for a story. And a story can be a novel, uh, a short story, a drabble, which is like 500 words or less. Um, but you could also apply this to dialogues and screenplays and scripts. Pretty much everything other than video game mediums, the, the things I'm pointing to, can, can be used. Uh, and you'll be able to use some of the fundamentals here on Teal's section as well, because these are all just good writing practices. Uh, the five writing points, which we'll get to in just a second, are sort of the, the, the seven writing points, are just sort of the seven best things that you need to hit upon in order to get those dialogue beats working properly. We're going to show samples of each of those writing points. Uh, I'm going to do my best to read properly. And uh, then we're going to go with three waves to improve your dialogue overall. That sounds I'm good. I'm going to keep my whistle wet here because my throat's already dry. Thank you. Allergies. Oh, and welcome to the stream, Corrigan. Yes, welcome, welcome. <laughs> hmm, seems to be looking. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's have some fun here. So in order to go through these writing points in the different samples, we are going to go over the great American classic, As the Ceiling Fan Turns, uh, a wonderful, gripping, romantic drama uh, written during the 1812, the War of 1812. So, uh, by the way, the uh, movie adaptation is amazing. You should absolutely check it out. So here we go, jumping into the writing point. So here is writing point number one. Enter late into the conversation. 
That is actually a, such a fundamental issue that so many people miss on any medium, stories, games, etc. People always start a conversation with, hi Bob, hi Jim, and they just start chatting about the weather. No one wants to read about that. You want to skip that irrelevant start of the conversation, which I refer to as the fluff. It's not necessary. What you want to do is start with a point that actually establishes the scene, establishes where you're at. So instead of having Bob approach Jim and say, hi Bob, hi Jim, what you want to do is have Bob, if he's approaching him, and you have to start with Bob approaching him saying, you know, the king's dead again, or, or you know, something along the lines of, you know, um, I just got my family to safety, or some relevant establishing piece of information. Don't, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing okay, how are you? There's no reason for the dialogue to start in, during the fluff. So either establish the scene within the first few lines of narrative or dialogue, or start in the meat of the conversation. Sheep bad, hedgehog good. Got it. Yes. <laughs> okay, so... For example, <clears throat> instead of saying they met within a graveyard at midnight, <laughs> say something like, Why did you call me out to a cemetery in this godforsaken hour? Think of it more along those lines. With the first with the first example, they met in the graveyard at midnight, all you're doing is you're just giving an establishing shot. It's literally like you're taking a camera, pointing, a, pointing it at the graveyard, seeing two people enter in, and expecting your readers to be entertained. With the second version, why did you call me out to a cemetery in this godforsaken hour? What you're doing is you're creating some sort of attention, some sort of uh, what does this mean to the reader? Why is this important? Why was this person drawn out into the cemetery at a godforsaken hour? Why are they irritated or concerned or what? Then have the characters at the meat of the conversation or near the conclusion of the conversation. In other words, when you're pushing the information out that's important. Things like, that is why I gathered you here tonight. That's a good conversation starter. When your very first line of dialogue is that, the reader is immediately going to wonder, wait, what happened? Why? And then you answer it in the subsequent narrative lines or dialogue lines. Or, we shouldn't have come here. That creates an immediate stake, a potential piece of danger. Now, you die. Can't ramp it up more than that, can you? So, the whole point of this is to rely on your readers to use their powers of inference to fill in the blanks. You're writing for, supposedly, adults. You're writing for people who have comprehension. You're not writing Harold and the Purple Crayon for second and first graders. Now, obviously, if you're writing for children, everything's a little different. This is only going over writing for adults. NYA. <laughs> All right, so here's some samples of entering that conversation late. And why could this not have waited until the morning? Philip asked, his shaky hands rattling the fresh candle within the lantern. Garfield bowed respectfully to the magistrate. With all due respect, my lord, he said, the enemy makes landfall within an hour. Without your approval, the city defenses will fail. And such a pity if it did. The bitterness in Philip's voice was so thick he choked on it. Bah, fine. Let me find my quill. The brass, con the brass candle holder continued to creak. He'd have to get on the butler about that in the morning. So, in this particular sample, you're immediately thrust into the result of Garfield waking up Magistrate Phillips. Now, we don't have the context here, obviously, this is just a sample of a great American masterpiece, but the reality is this, you immediately know something is wrong. And then when Phillips says the enemy, when Garfield says the enemy makes landfall, you know there's a stake, and we've talked about this in our previous classrooms, Stakes are important. Not only are they tasty, stakes also draw the reader in on what the character has to potentially lose. Um, before moving on, anything you'd like to add, Teal? No, you did a very good job explaining that point. Very good. All right, moving on. Tip number two. Give each character a unique voice. This is exceedingly important. Um, this is just a one of seven points but I can't tell you how many times I've read a manuscript that someone has wanted me to look at 
I can't tell you how many times I've read a short story that's been published on one of many websites. I can't tell you how many times Teal or I have looked at a game where this tip has not been followed. And yes, Kia, this point is so important. Every person speaks in their own uniquely and identifiable way. And your writing, regardless of what you're writing for, should reflect that. Characters can use anything from shortcut words like y'all to figures of speech like colloquialisms. I can rattle this off forever because I'm Cajun. Um, to the tone and tenor of their voice. This is like uh, excitable versus reserved. So a, a excitable person is going to have their words come out very short form very quickly. Even if you're not reading them, if you're reading them, you will say, hey, this is coming out very excitably. Something like, you know, the Masons will be, the Masons will be rebelling at dawn does not read like the Masons will be rebelling at dawn. It reads like the Masons will be rebelling at dawn. So the word choice and how they flow together will create that sort of excitability. While reserved would be, I do believe the rebellion, I do believe the Masons are beginning to rebel. Pity. That's more reserved. Uh, anime actually is really good at this, sometimes annoyingly so. Anime will use repetitive phrasing. For example, the old Fushigi Yugi anime, the character of Chichiro, used to say no da at the end of every sentence. Um, an anime that Teal and I are watching right now called uh, Re... something... The guy who keeps coming back to life. He has the respawn ability. Relive right. or re-repeat or... I am terrible with names. But uh, there's a uh, little librarian character who says I suppose at the end of almost everything. Those are... Re-Zero. Thank you, Reverie. These are... actual vocal... ticks. Vocal figures of speech that give credence to the character and make the character talk uniquely. Now here's the last one. Here's the one that every, this was what separates the amateurs from the pros. Vocal cadence. Vocal cadence, if you can start putting vocal cadence into your actual writing, where it's audible inside the reader's head as they're reading, then you have gone from the first level to over 9,000 as a writer. That is, that is how you know you have hit the pro level. So vocal cadence is the rhythm in which a person speaks, which words they emphasize, and the voice pitch up and down during sentence formation. Writing that is exceedingly difficult. We could actually make a creator classroom just on vocal cadence. I could have a short form video, which I probably should, on vocal cadence. When you're writing vocal cadence, it's you're visualizing how the character sounds when they speak. For example, whenever Steele speaks, especially in an official capacity, he raises up during the initial points, bringing his pitch up and the emphasis of his voice higher, almost as if they are capitalized. Then I drop them down afterwards. I have a very recognizable vocal cadence. So that is just sort of the primer on that. Um, that is one of the things that you as a writer will be mastering over the course of your writing career. So now we're going to move on to our sample. Welcome to the stream, Boo Boo Hotel. Mrs. Morak paced the length of the room as if it were a race to be won. We can't let those Russian Aberdons win the general's favor first. I, Mr. Morak, Mr. Morak said, folded. The, <clears throat> sorry, I, Mr. Morak, folded the pamphlet once. Considerate the second headline. It, it's simply dreadful how they know every move we make. She paused at the mantle to briefly touch the family heirloom, her fingers tingling upon the solid gold. No, she mustn't. We may have to take up Phillips on his offer. Mr. Morak flipped the paper over, gazed at the column on the back. Aye. Turning like a viper, Mrs. Morak glared at her husband. Are you even paying attention? Aye, he said. She shouldn't have married a banker. So in this particular example, Mrs. Morak speaks very excitably. You can tell by the words surrounding her dialogue. She paced the length of the room as if it were a race. That means hurriedness, movement, quickness. She's moving uh, excitedly. So when I read that, that she paced the length of the room as if it were a race to be won, 
the moment she talks, my brain fills in the blank that she's speaking excitably. Then her husband just simply says the word I. That's it, nothing else. So he has almost a plop, almost a no-sell to her entire concern. Okay, this could be a one-off, maybe, maybe not. But then, right afterwards, it's simply dreadful. She's continuing, she's continuing the same cadence as before. Her word choices, what she is saying is the same as before. My brain fills in the blanks that she's speaking excitably. Then she pauses at the mantle very briefly. Remember, there's the word briefly to touch the family heirloom. She's considering something. And then she says, and even if this is slower, it still shows that measure of excitability. We may have to take up Phillips on his offer. And then when her husband says I a second time, almost dismissively, we have now nailed their personalities through their dialogue, especially him. We know that Mr. Morak is not excitable. He's reserved. Whether he doesn't care about his wife's feelings or he has a plan or something else, he's not currently showing that he's bothered. So he's laid back, whereas she's very excitable. Exactly. Very energetic, very driven. Right, right. And then she turns like a viper. Vipers are fast. And then she glares at him. Are you even paying attention? And he clenches it with a third eye. And that's it. So now we know everything we need to know about the character's initial personalities off of that. Mrs. Morak is excitable about whatever's happening. Most likely excitable in general. Mr. Mora, not at all. He's laid back. He's that reserve type. Exactly, Kia. And then we make the, he, she shouldn't have married a banker comment at the end. Not only is that a little bit of aha humor, uh, but it also is, um, it kind of pushes that stereotype, that cliche of bankers being reserved. Ergo, we now have in our mind the husband's character, and he's only said three words. Okay, moving on to tip number three. Oh, anything you want to add, hon? Uh, interesting word choice that you have Mrs. Moorcock turning like a viper. Right. Because you immediately think of something nefarious. Um, yes. A viper is has a negative connotation. It does. So yeah. it, it's, it gives the impression that there's been some antagonism between the husband and wife. Absolutely. And that's the point. So you, just by reading that one word, are able to infer, there's that word again, inference, that there's not necessarily roses and candies in their marriage. Right. <laughs> All right, moving on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tip number three, change character voice depending upon recipient. So take all that stuff you just learned from tip number two, and now we're going to take it to the next level. So this next level is changing your voice dependent upon the recipient. So what that means is that very plainly, people speak differently to different people. I speak very differently to you all, my audience, as the way I speak to my friends. I speak to my wife, Teal, different than I speak to anyone else. I speak to my mother differently than I speak to anyone else. I am not a cardboard cutout. And that is where, now going back to that anime comment in tip number two, the anime genre generally falls flat. Not always, but generally. Real people change their word choice and their tone and their tenor depending on whether or not they have a close connection to someone or someone's in a position of authority over them. Think of how you can have the arrogant noble who suddenly gets very reticent when he's speaking to his king. That's a good example. Um, a person who is normally very reserved might open up more when in private with someone they're close or intimate with. It just depends. Um, everyone speaks differently. What they don't generally change is their cadence. The cadence changes generally when someone is either performing, like I am right now. I do not speak like this normally outside of our streams. Um, or... Yes, sorry, I got distracted by Kia. Yes, or even code switching. Exactly. So, <clears throat> back to what I was saying. Uh, cadence only switches when a person is literally um, changing how they want to talk on purpose. Otherwise, you don't think about your vocal cadence changing. So, tone, tenor, uh, word choice, 
Those are a little bit more conscience, conscious, I mean, subconscious, my God, the other way around, while vocal cadence is more conscious. All right. <clears throat> you can markedly show up and develop a character by changing how they talk to different people. And let's go over that sternness versus kindness. So we have the stern person is now kind to someone else in private. Maybe you have the stern, you know, um, the stern noble who is very uh, to his peasants who are working his land. But the moment he's alone with his children, he becomes this kind, sweet, soft-spoken person. Um, actually, heck, the uh, Overlord anime was fantastic about that. I keep going back to anime because we've been watching a lot of it. But there was a character who was very, uh, almost uh, sneering. And then the moment he was alone with his, his son, he was literally the kindest person around. Uh, anger versus empathy. That's another good one. A lot of people who have aggressiveness tend to show their aggressiveness to just about everyone except for those who they are either closest to or have a special connection to. Um, and then indifference versus less indifference. So you could have a character like Mr. Moorcock, who is literally an indifferent person and then is left indif less, in less indifferent to someone else. Um, and this is all very important because you never want to pass up a chance to develop a character based solely on what they say to another character. You can actually give so much information about Mr. Moorcock based solely on him talking to someone else. So, let's do just that. <clears throat> it wasn't until the enemy general left the house that Mr. Moorcock finally spoke to his friend. We should have said something. He was giving us an out. Cyrus Cranston stroked his stubbly chin. We'd just be falling deeper into his trap, he said. Don't you have that girl stashed away in your attic? Why can't he use her? Mr. Morocox liked Mr. Morocks liked the taste of that less than he did his wife's cooking. Claudette saved my life. Twice. I'd never betray her. I see, Cyrus said. Then you're set to do this. Aye. It was the only proper response. So in this particular instance, we see a different side of Mr. Morcock. He is less of a indifferent person, less dismissive, and is showing uh, a real concern for this character Claudette. He even says she saved my life, me life, twice. He's talking alone with this guy Cyrus. This enemy general character has left. So now it's just these two and there's an issue and they're discussing it and this person who was very indifferent in a previous scene is now more engaged. Engaged about Claudette. And to kind of wrap it around in a bow, he uses the word I which is what he was using when he was dismissing his wife, but now it has an entirely different context. Yes, the word I is his word. That is his identifying word. It's his phrase. However, in this instance, we're seeing it now have heart behind it, as opposed to indifference. Anything on your end, Teal? I, I, um, it's a, when he says that makes a comparison of that to his wife's cooking it's a callback right to the uh, indifference the dislike he feels towards his wife right so any suspicion you had in the previous scene that there was a problem between mr and mrs moorcock has now been confirmed there is an issue between the two of them whatever it may be these two have had either an unsavory or at the very least a cool marriage for quite some time let us continue. Point number four. <laughs> the use of dialogue tags. Whew. Okay, so I'm a quick, a tw a quick sidebar. Um, you can always tell how novice and amateur a writer is based on how they use dialogue tag. You can also tell how far along someone is on their journey to becoming a professional writer also based on their dialogue tags. It's kind of a unwritten code word. It's just a way that us people who have been doing this for years can say, okay, this person just started. This person's been doing it for a while. Because without fail, almost every single novice writer overuses dialogue tags. Um, you know, I want to go to the store, he said. Why do you want to go to the store? She, she asked. Well, because, he said, rubbing his chin, I really want an apple. Where can we get the best apples? She asked, tapping her lips. Well, he said, 
How about if we go to the produce aisle? The produce aisle? That sounds like a wonderful idea, she said. How many times did I say said? I actually lost track. That's overusing. Don't overtag. Okay. Also, here's another novice version of writing. I would like to go to the store, he declared. Why do you want to go to the store? She asked. Because, he pontificated quietly, I haven't had an apple in a long time. Where do you think we can get the best apple? She wondered aloud. I believe we can go to the produce aisle, he answered. That sounds great, she said with a smile. Let's go to the produce aisle. I mean, it's so cumbersome. It was cumbersome to come up with that on the fly, much less say. That was hard because it, it, it reads amateurishly. So that brings you to my second bullet point. The tag said is literally invisible to the reader when they're engrossed. It's noticeable when it's overused, but when it's not overused, when it's used correctly, it becomes invisible. And what you want to do is use to the second point, to the third point, is use as few tags as humanly possible. It's actually better to say, I would like to go to the store. He stood up and began to get his shoes. Why do you want to go there? She looked up. She looked up from her book. Why do you want to go there? There, I didn't tag at all in those two sentences. In other words, don't tag. If you can tag as little as possible, good for you. When you do have to tag, use simple tags especially the magical said tag. And you'll see that in the next uh, sample instead of Steele trying to make stuff up off the cuff. <laughs> and also, last point, only use other tags like asked, commented, exclaimed, when it's absolutely no other way to express the viewpoint. Or when you have to emphasize that point enough that you're willing to slow down the scene. So, if a character gets shot and she says, Father, she screamed, you have just put all the emphasis on that. Now, if you've been having characters scream and bellow and giggle, uh, whatever their words out, the entire book, that one screamed is going to lose its impact. Think of it like hitting a speed bump. Every time you use a tag, you hit a small speed bump. Every time you hit a tag other than the word said, you hit a larger speed bump. You can use those speed bumps strategically in order to get your reader to slow down enough to realize the magnitude of what just happened. But if you overuse those speed bumps, you're just going to have busted up axles. And nobody wins. Moving on to sample four. Now, the following has absolutely no dialogue tags at all. I'm prefacing that. Listen to me read it. Sound how coherent it sounds. <clears throat> Philip stood over the battered body of Mr. Moorcock, ripping onto his dueling saber as if the world itself conspired to wrench it from his grasp. I wish it hadn't come to this, John. Aye. It was all Mr. Moorcock could muster. Most of his strength split, spilt upon the town's cobblestone square. He focused his gaze through the crowd, past his mortified wife, resting it upon Claudette's white face. Don't let her die. I will. Philip spared no glance and no inflection, lest the only chance of their survival be discovered. That was enough, and Mr. Moorcock closed his eyes as a general approached, gun drawn. Let freedom ring. He didn't hear that final shot. No dialogue tags, none at all. Um, and yet I conveyed all the emotion and information, and you would have felt it um, even if I had read it. In fact, I could have read it monotone, Ben, ben Stein style. And there still would have been emotion there simply because of the word choices and the fact that instead of tagging, I com I married together each line of dialogue with an appropriate action narrative. Everything that each character did complemented what they said, and what they said complemented what they did. And when you as a writer are able to take action and narrative, I'm sorry, action and dialogue, and marry them together properly, to where they literally work together as two pieces of a puzzle coming together to form a complete moment, then you've graduated to that next level of writing. Uh, anything on your end, honey? No, it's a very good example. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> well, let's all have a retrospective moment of silence for poor Mr. Moorcock. He dead. All right, moving on. Tip number five. 
dialogue beats and action beats Whew. okay this is a fun one all right <clears throat> Think of every piece of narration and dialogue as the beat of a musical number. If you can actually start to imagine that in your head, the ba bam ba bam ba bam ba bam, bam, then your writing will improve dramatically. So when you're writing, develop and follow that rhythm of beats. So what you want to do is think of it like words, words, action, 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 words, action, action, words, words, action, action, words, words, action. Think of it like a pattern, like a beat. You're sitting there and you're trading back and forth between a moment of dialogue and a moment of action. Don't use one more than the other. See when one cuts off into the other. This is one of those other things like vocal cadence that I could literally do an entire creative classroom on and should probably do a short form video. Developing action beats are super, super important. Oh, Reverie, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, to be fair, the actual craft of writing is highly complex and most most people just think it's it's putting words on a page and yes you have to do that in order to get better so all of the techniques we ever give you on writing aside you have to keep writing every single day in order to get better so if you're writing if you're putting out those words on a page or in the dialogue boxes of your video games you're getting better um it takes years like any other skill how long does it take to get good at piano good at a piano years how long does it take to get good at archery or martial arts years just keep going one after another it's best to relate these points to like some form of fiction that you like neck oh that's very true very true kia yes yes kia hit the high point right there Relate it to the types of fiction you like Relate it to something you are familiar with familiarity teaches better than any lecture that is an absolute truth okay Focus on how the dialogue and the actions complement each other. So that kind of talks about how dialogue, action, complement. I mentioned that earlier. That is the best way to develop your dialogue and action beats. How does me saying I want an apple complement me getting up to get my shoes on? How does Teal putting down her book complement her entering the conversation? Those are the things that as a writer, you need to be thinking about along with, well, how is my character developing? How is my story flowing? Now, like everything that is a skill set, over time it becomes muscle memory. So if you're watching this, whether it be live or on VOD, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so much to take in. The more you practice at it, the more your muscle memory kicks in and it just becomes a thing you do. Lastly, be descriptive and let the beats move the scene forward. A lot of people have this weird fear of writing too many words and I get it I was there once because when you're editing and revising you cut down and it's so much easier and Teal please back me up on this if, if you agree it's so much easier to subtract during editing than to add during editing yes that's absolutely true so I'd rather see you write more during a draft and then later pull the unnecessary bits than put not enough information and have to slide it in the right way when I was working on the uh, manuscript, when I, whenever I work on any manuscript actually of mine, um, I overwrite. So I'll end up with something that's 160, 170,000 words. And then after Teal and I get done hacking at it with a machete, it's about 150 to 140, which is more, you know, fantasy length. That's 30,000 words that go bye bye. That's a lot better than me starting with 120 and adding 130 words to it. That is a lot harder. Your math, Steel. Oh, I can't math. Steel can. <laughs> I am doing a presentation. <laughs> I'm almost out of water, too. It's too hot here in Houston. All right. <clears throat> Let us do our um, sample of number five here. <clears throat> Lady Aberdon held out her teacup so that the maid could fill it. Now that the Moorcocks are out of the way, all that is left is for New Orleans to fall. Garfield rubbed his hands over his pants back and forth as he strained not to make eye contact with Claudette. Hidden in plain sight, the one thing that could end the war in the Union's favor, and here she was serving refreshment. Pardon me for asking, my lady, but hasn't there been enough death? Has there? Lady Aberdon rested her hands on her lap. Teacup, her scepter in the court of her drawing room. Once the Port of Orleans is in British hands, nothing will stop Admiral Cochrane from landing. He'll meet the General, and the Union will fall. Garfield gasped, his breath overshadowed by Claudette, who fumbled with the teapot, 
spilling steaming hot liquid upon her mistress's dress. Stupid girl! Lady Aberdon raised her hand in a, in a fiery rage and then let it fly. Um, so this, this particular example is a lot like playing ping pong. It's a lot like playing table tennis, as some people call it. I'm going back and forth between the words that the characters say and the actions, and I'm making sure that every single one of these complemented each other. I'm making sure that when Lady Aberdyne is holding out her teacup, it's, you know, just holding it off to the side as she's having a conversation with Garfield. I bring that back in her very next paragraph, where I reference it like a scepter to a queen holding court. The court being, of course, drawing room. That's all the information you need to know about Lady Aberdyne, even if you've never seen her in the story before. Garfield, who has been previously shown as a uh, kind of the errand guy. Well, now he's trying not to betray this important point, whatever that may be with Claudette. And now we get into a bit of evil plans being given and uh-oh, boom, the gasp. And then Lady Aberdon gets ready to slap Claudette and does. So every single one of these, it's action, dialogue, action, dialogue. The actual beat is as follows. Action, dialogue, action, action, dialogue, dialogue, action, action, dialogue. Action, action, dialogue, dialogue. Action. There. So, there we go. Um, I probably missed that up a little bit, but, you know, you're asking me to do that off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, anything to add there, Teal? Well, uh, as far as beats go, I'm looking at the paragraphs themselves. Right. And Lady Aberdeen, Garfield. Lady Aberdeen, Garfield. Lady Aberdeen. Right. Yep. Now, if we were going to do an advanced writing class, if we were actually going to teach you writing techniques, I would have replaced Garfield's second uh, Garfield with he. Because we already know he's the only male in the scene, so you can say he. Same thing with Lady Aberdeen. Lady Aberdeen's second or third would be a she at some point, whenever it doesn't clash with Claudette. Because if the last person who spoke or did something was Lady Aberdeen, and Lady Aberdeen does something again, we can use the pronoun she. However, that is outside the scope of this workshop, so please forget about that for now. We can always address <laughs> that some other time. Pronouning is its own thing. Let's move on. Tip number six. Show as much as possible. We have ridden people about this on our Let's Plays back when we used to do those. We ride things, we ride AAA developers about that during our critical plays on Wednesday and Thursday. We bitch about it all the time. This is, other than writer's convenience, one of the things that drives Teal and I bonkers. Yeah. The most important thing for every writer is show, not tell. And you think as uh, you think that it's not as important as it is because who cares if you say, hey, the apple was red. When you do that, when you tell, and do a very brief show versus tell explanation, telling would be the apple is red. Showing would be he picked up the apple admiring its crimson color. Showing in dialogue would be that apple's looking a little less rosy than the others. Thank you. Exactly, Kia. 100%. All tell is just an informal essay. And to the novice writer, they think, you know, people will think there's no problem. And I'm not putting down the novice writer because we've all been there. But, you know, the initial thought is, well, why can't I tell? Because, like Kia said, it's an informal essay. If you sit back and read tell, someone else's all tell, it's boring. It feels dry. It feels lifeless. Showing, the more you show, gives the reader a sense of engagement. It's how our brains are wired to engage. We see tell, we're collecting information. We see show, we are participating. Use that as a writer to your advantage to work with the psychology of your reader and draw them into your world. Don't let the narrator explain what's going on. Let the dialogue do it. Now, that is a bit... That's a bit paradoxical to what I just said. Because you can use the narrator to explain something. And there's a difference between he picked up the apple admiring its crimson sheen as opposed to the apple was red. However, for the purposes of this particular workshop, let the dialogue use it. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Corrigan. Uh, it's a lot of information to take in, and unfortunately, when I get done, we're only halfway through because Teal's going to talk about it from a video game standpoint. Um, writing dialogue is not easy. Um, a lot of the games that Teal and I have played when we did our Let's Plays uh, fall apart in the dialogue because the dialogue is where you have a chance to develop your characters, it's where you have a chance to move your story forward, and it's where you have a chance to engage your player. And a lot of people just, they drop the ball on it. And unfortunately, um, there's no easy way to fix it. While you can tell some, exposition is always best for the characters to bring out. It is more engaging for a character to say, the British are coming, than it is to say, and thus at dawn the British, the British landed upon the beach. It's just more engaging. You, you get more stakes. Well, yes, Bubahotep, exactly. Um, but, you know, hey, take it, learn, and, and grow. Give us a version 7.8 or an 8.9 or whatever version it is, and then put it in the, uh, what do you call it? Put it in Unreal, right? Yes. Uh, Yorkshire says, are we? Um, what is that in reference to, Yorkshire? I'm sorry. Kia says, it's either bad dialogue or lack of dialogue, but the story still moves on somehow, unless you go textless. Okay, let me, let me, each one of those. So Kia says, uh, bad dialogue or the lack of dialogue, but still, the more story still moves on. And then can marry that into what Zarshla says, which is textless. You don't have to have text. Some amazing games don't even have dialogue. You can have everything, but that's all show at that point. If you have a game that is just having the animations move the story forward, like a, a Journey, or um, actually Journey's fantastic. That, that game, Journey, I think it's by the same people that did Ico. Um, oh, that's funny, Yorkshire, okay. Um, but yes, uh, that game Journey, I don't think it has any dialogue at all, and all the information that you need is in the character's actions as, as they move about. So, there you go. Um, and then bad dialogue or lack of dialogue, uh, Kia can also create a disconnect, if I'm reading what you're asking or saying properly. Um, the story can move on regardless of which, but how much connection do you want your player to your game? The greater the connection, the greater their engagement, the greater they're going to play your game. And that's the same with a story, too. If you're reading a book and you're only slightly engaged, you may put it down a chapter. And then, okay, I read a chapter here, I'll pick it up in a week. And maybe you do, maybe you don't. But if you feel connected to the story you're reading, you're going to keep that book going. And that is the goal of every author, is to have someone read their book from start to finish. Just as it's, just as it's the goal of every developer, to have someone play their game from start to finish. So you want to create as much of a connection and avoid the disconnection as much as possible. And Yorkshire pudding, we like Yorkshire tea here, so please bring the gold version. We haven't tried that yet. <sighs> Back to the thing. You want a sizable show ratio versus a tell ratio, and I feel like at this point I'm repeating myself, so we're just going to move onward. Here's the sample. We're leaving, now. Garfield grabbed a handful of Claudette's clothes. Magistrate Bowers is in the couch out back. We gotta get before, La we gotta get before Lady Aberdon comes back with the general. Claudette pulled herself from bed, searing pinches of pain traveling up her leg. Let me help, she said, hobbling towards the dresser. Garfield was at her side before he could make the third hop, before she could make the third hop. Begging your highness, but you took a bullet to the knee. Please, let me get this. He helped her to a chair and then returned to his task. Thank you, Claudette said, muttering a silent swear beneath her breasts, more so at the trouble than the pain. There's something I have to know, though. Why? Is this why John sacrificed himself? The silence in the room was broken as Garfield spoke his former boss' favorite word, I. So, yes, I do go and I uh, use some narrative show as opposed to just straight up tell. Uh, but a lot of it is also put out in the dialogue as well. The urgency is put out in, we're leaving now. The magistrate out back before Aberdon comes back with the general. That creates the urgency. Let me help shows the uh, Claudette's personality regardless of her injury. Then Garfield talking about her injury. He states her injury so that you, the reader, don't have to read about it in narration. And then Claudette thanking and then asking about John brings back to a previous scene and shows the connection between Mr. Moorcock, John, and Claudette. And then I, exactly, Mwah. exactly, Kia, that last I is the icing on the cake and a perfect send-off for John Moorcock's soul. That is like the way to, boom, 
<laughs> Why Iron Man? Iron Man's gone. Uh, anything on your end, honey? No. <laughs> so yes, we spent we spent a delicious amount of time on this, and I'm I hope it helped you all. All right, let's move on to the seventh and last point. <laughs> move quickly between characters. Long winding monologues. Let me try that again. Long winding monologues and long winding blocks of tests are unpalatable. I just like the way that sentence read better <laughs> than it sounded. Um, but it is unpalatable. It is hard to digest. Long monologues. He was a good man, Bubba Hotep. Um, it, it's hard. It is very hard. When the bad guy sits there and gives his evil plan, um, it's so much easier if something happens in the background to break it up. Think of conversational beats as ping pong or verbal tennis. I've already said that earlier. Back and forth, back and forth. Is that small recurring stuff that matters? Yes, it is. It is, Kia. That's those small comments like I. That ties the whole mwah, the narrative together. I'm going to do that chef's gift. That was amazing. Mwah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Move quickly between speaking characters and let the story flow out in pieces and parts. Biggest problem that every new writer or game developer that Teal and I have ever come across makes. We're going to get it all out to you at once. You know, we're going to give you the Final Fantasy VI intro every five minutes. We don't want that. Nobody wants that. Don't do it. Just stop. Instead, give out a little piece. Give out a crumb. Get the reader or player to move on more. Then give out another crumb. Give them to go out a little more. Forgive the analogy for sounding like this. But you want to starve your players for information just enough so that they read on a little more, but not starve them so much that they get annoyed with you. And it's that balance that is extremely difficult and all writers should strive for, as well as all game developers. And when you find that balance of giving out just enough that your hungry readers or players will go just a little bit further, then you know you've hit the proper stride. Let's go to the last sample and see how this gripping drama ends. <laughs> this is how it ends. Well, there you go. This is how it ends. The general pulled back the hammer on his gun, looking away from Garfield's lifeless body. Phillips used his remaining arm to push up enough so that he could glare every ounce of his hatred onto his enemy. The general lowered the pistol at the prone magistrate's head. Nothing to say. Phillips spat. He would give the British bastard the satisfaction of a retort. So be it, the general said. Contempt, not contemplate, contempt parting his lips. Then this is good. A shot rang out, and the general stumbled and fell. Mr. Morkoff Reichel shook and clawed at small hands. Let freedom ring. So, a lot here. I go back and forth between the general and uh, Magistrate Phillips, who is obviously injured. I show attention to the fact that, unfortunately, Garfield did not make it to the end. And uh, we have a, a back and forth here. Comment, counter comment, comment, counter comment, comment, counter comment to the point where Magistrate Phillips refuses to give his enemy the chance to retort his final words. He just gives a defiant spit. The general gives contempt, and then he gets shot by Claudette holding Mr. Moorcock's rifle, who then say, who says Mr. Moorcock's final words. If you recall, when Mr. Moorcock died, he said, let freedom ring. Boom, that's what she says. So that kind of ties it all together in a nice, neat little bow. But the idea is that we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then bang, boom, dead, let freedom ring. Anything you want to add there, honey? Uh, no, it, again, it has a rhythm to it. Right. Right. And of course, all of this was put together during the uh, construction of this particular greater classroom. So is it as polished as it would be as if I had written it, gone through a few revisions, Teal had looked it over, and we revised it again? No, of course not. It's going to be rough. But the idea is to show you how it looks, the framework. And uh, as we say, go back around to that Let Freedom Ring. So we've now taken both of Mr. Moorcox, both of John Moorcox's words, I and Let Freedom Ring, and boom, put it together. Yes, that little spite in Claudette saying that. Exactly. Yeah, you can imagine in your head Claudette saying, maybe even through gritted teeth, you know, 
let freedom ring. You know, that kind of, just that little bit of spite. The man who killed Mr. Moorcock got killed by Mr. Moorcock's own gun with Mr. Moorcock's final words being said. That is called... That's called justice. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's move on. Okay, here's some final tips. And these are these five, three final tips that are going to help you really polish up your dialogue, okay? <clears throat> the first one is read your dialogue out loud to see how it sounds, how it carries, and how it conveys emotion. You'll also ca catch little mistakes like saying contemplate instead of contempt. Those are the greatest thing you can ever do for yourself whenever you're writing dialogue for a story. Short story, book, doesn't matter, or a video game, is read every line of dialogue out loud. It will take time, but it will save you tons of headache. It will also allow you to kind of decide how the vocal cadence of your characters go and allow you to adjust your writing accordingly. Number two, remove superfluous dialogue and conversations. If it doesn't move your story forward, delete it. It doesn't matter. Um, in fact, that goes with anything, really. If it doesn't move your story forward, it doesn't belong in your story. Same thing with your video game. Change up dialogue and narrative structures. Don't always have this thing being said, character said it. A lot of people will do that. That's also another obvious novice mistake, where you go, I want to go to the store, he said. Why do you want to go to the store? She asked. You know, I'm just saying. Dialogue. The person who said the dialogue. Dialogue. The person. It's so boring. Change it up a little. Have the person say something and then there, the dialogue. Have dialogue. Action. Dialogue. Because you can have two pieces of dialogue sandwiching action together in a paragraph. Perfectly allowed. Um, you want to give a little bit of experimentation on what kind of writing style works for you and your characters. And you want to give your character's life through those dialogue tags and whether they're speaking, then acting, or acting, then speaking. It is contextual. There is no one way to do it or one way to not do it. But when you continue to write these different uh, um, characters in different ways, you allow your writing to breathe life into the character instead of your writing just stating what the character says and does. Um, we have a few minutes before we go ahead and end this part and pass on to the next, which will be Teal doing dialogue and games. So, do we have any last minute questions for me, Steel, or uh, Teal, do you have anything you want to add about writing dialogue in general? I would say that when you're writing dialogue, mm -hmm. think about how the character is saying it. For instance, Mm -hmm. A a character with a a thick mountain accent mm -hmm. is going to speak their words differently than uh, someone from the frontier. A hundred percent, absolutely. Um, a French noble is going to sound different than a British noble. Everyone talks a bit differently. Um, Mark Twain did that. Oh, yes. In his his novels, um, he would uh, drop the G's mm -hmm. during dialogue only. Right. So they would say "fixin" instead of "fixing." Right. And there is nothing wrong with that. Um, I've had German characters who have said "zat" instead of "dat." Now you don't want to do it all the time. You don't want to have every single every single th be a z for your German for your German doctor. But every now and then, doing things like what she's talking about, like what Mark Twain did, that's absolutely what you do. It's your your writing um, vocal style at that point. Uh, Kia asks, would you also would you also suggest to pay attention to how people around you talk to get a nice grasp of how fluid conversations can be? Absolutely. And then you want to be more fluid than real life conversations. When people talk, I mean, listen to me when I'm talking. None of this was practiced ahead of time. I did my my slides, I looked over my notes, and I still have stumbled. But that's okay. Human beings stumble. Not everyone is an improv genius and can come up with stuff off the cuff and always have exactly the right words at exactly the right time. But your characters that you write do. 
you want to cut down on your stumbling. So, Kia, yes, 100% do what you're suggesting, but remember that your characters speak idealistically. Your characters will speak without stumbling nearly as much unless them stumbling creates a character point, a moment, um, or moves some sort of narrative forward because they're nervous. Reverie asks, oh, thank you, Boba Hotep, for the compliment. Reverie asks, how would you deal with a conversation within a larger group, say four or five participants? Make sure that the people who speak are, are moving the conversation forward when they are speaking and occasionally draw attention to the non-speakers so that the reader remembers that they're there. The last thing you want to do in any large group is have people forget someone is there. For example, let's say we have five people sitting around and they're talking about dinner tonight. And you have one person who hasn't said something in a while. You can draw attention to them, especially if they're getting ready to speak by saying, Jennifer rubbed her fingers over her wine glass. Her brow slightly furrowed. You just, she didn't say anything, but you drew attention to the fact that she's there. You reminded the reader she existed and you've prepped them for perhaps her saying something in a few more beats. So, and you kind of trade it off. What you don't want to do, the Reverie, and what a lot of people do um, in both their stories and in their video games, is they'll kind of go round robin. Character A will say something, character B will say something, character C will say something, character A will say something, character B, character C, you know what I'm saying? So A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. That is not natural, that's weird. Unless you're specifically doing a round robin on person, it's it, it kind of pulls you out. So have A and B talk about something related to A and B, but have C sitting there watching, have D cough, and then have D say something a few seconds later, and have B reply, and then have C reply to it and put out their information, and then have A for it. In other words, it's like a ping pong game. You're just kind of tossing the hot potato around at each other, but it's relevant to the conversation. Hopefully that helped, Reverie. Uh, any other questions or any other comments, Teal? Mm, no. Okay. Um, any other questions? We'll give it a minute and then we'll go ahead and uh, go on BRB. Awesome. Glad I could help, Reverie. Okay. Oh, we go. Yorkshire has. Have you guys seen the film Throw Mama from the Train with Danny DeVito and Billy Crystal? Years ago, that was with the woman who played Mama Fratella from uh, The Goonies. Yes. Which, by the way, Goonies is the greatest Sean Astin movie ever. Fight me. Um, but, uh, I have many, many years ago, Yorkshire, uh, I think I saw it on HBO back when HBO was a thing. So if you're asking me to remember a particular moment, I'm probably going to have to wince and go, I don't remember, but I did see it and it was quite humorous. All right. Any other... Uh, that's right. It's about a writer. Yes, it is. It is good. It is. Just, it's been. It has been a hot year. There, I didn't say hot minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other last minute questions? Otherwise, we are going to go to BRB, and when we come back, Teal will be here in the player's seat, talking about games. You have one more minute on my clock. This has been. Uh, this was actually a lot of. This was, I'm not going to sit here and pat myself on the back. I'm just going to say this was rough condensing down <laughs> into seven talking points that you all could use. Um, because it's such a, a large subject. It is. I mean, they have entire courses on mm -hmm. this, college courses. They do. They have college courses. They have workshops. And I've been to some of them where uh, it's all been about just dialogue writing. And we're talking like a full six hour day with one hours for lunch yep it's this is intense this is along the lines of the story arc one that i did a few weeks ago about a month ago it's it's a lot of work but but the thing is is that once you master the art of dialogue writing you are really going to up your game okay so at this time we're going to go ahead and brb and okay. uh we'll be gone for about maybe three to five minutes and when we come back teal will be here and she will be talking about video games all right let's be right back guys and we're back. How is everyone doing? Hope you're doing well. Welcome to the second part of our creator classroom. I'm going to be presenting dialogue in video games. <clears throat> if you're just joining us, this is writing dialogue in stories and games. And my wife, Teal, will be presenting the second half. 
Apologies for the BRB music being muted. I don't know why that was the case, but hey, here we are. <laughs> All right, honey, take it away. All righty. So in in my part of the uh, in my part of the classroom, I will be detailing what is the purpose of dialogue, how is it presented in games, and best practices of writing your video game dialogue. The purpose of dialogue is to... Okay, the slides are out of order again, Steel. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> that, I, blame, I blame PowerPoint. Oh my goodness, okay. Well, it's okay. <laughs> the purpose of your game dialogue is to, first of all, you need to convey information to the player. Uh, this can be anything from where a certain object is located in the quest to uh, what is happening to their country, their king, to what the weather is like in some other place. You need to, that, that is the purpose of dialogue to convert, convey information to the player. Also, you want to guide the player through the game. Uh, this is best shown by going up to an NPC and they give you a side quest and you continue to go through the side quest and people are telling you things and you're following what they're doing and finally you want to engage the player there's nothing more boring than just sitting there and watching uh, text as it goes up on the screen just telling you this is what's going on and this is why it's happening it's very boring a uh, case in point would be the opening of uh, xenosaga oh very much so that is almost like a 10 minute exposition <laughs> and you're just sitting there that's not engaging at all you're just watching a movie at that point Dialogue draws you into the story and to the action. Uh, let me go ahead and make a comment on what you just of said. Of course. Interestingly enough, you mentioned the start of Xeno Saga, which, uh, after you get past the whole unlocking of the Zohar, is just dialogueless except for commands being given to activate Cosmos. You look at the opening animation for Xena Gears, and it's the spaceship uh, getting destroyed as uh, Deus awakes. So, two very similar properties, I mean the same technical universe, and one handles itself in a very engaging way, while the other makes you almost feel like you're watching the start of a an episode of some sci-fi show. Right, it it's like you're just sitting there passively watching a TV show or a movie. Right. Not engaging at all. Not engaging. All right, let's see if I can get the slides correctly. Here we go. Let's go over the various video game dialogue systems. There are four ways that you can present dialogue. The first one is called linear. Linear dialogue is a conversation between two characters that's always the same. Player interaction is very minimal. They initiate the conversation and then they press the button to move to the next dialogue box. So for example, you go up to uh, two NPCs, you press the button and one says, it's really hot today. The next one says, Yes, it's really hot. My cows are suffocating. You press the, the button again. The first NPC says, Yes, you probably should get them in the barn. <laughs> okay, then you press it again. And the NPC says, Yeah, it's really hot today. <laughs> That's linear dialogue. So basically, they repeat themselves ad nauseum regardless of anything. Exactly. Wow. The pros of this is that it's very easy to implement. It's very easy for you as a game dev to implement. 
it will allow you to tell a very specific story. But the cons of this is that this can feel very unengaging to the player. Mm. And an unengaged player is a bored player. Is this where we get the whole times are tough joke? Yes. This is exactly where you get times are tough. <laughs> you go up to the NPC sitting at a bar, you press your, your button, and he says, times are tough. And you press it again, he says, times are tough. <laughs> so to make sure that we all understand, a linear dialogue isn't even rotating. Where you talk to them, they give topic A, then you talk to them again, they give topic B, then C, then D, and then they start over at A. Yes. This is, they just do A over and over again. No, that's not it. Okay. Linear dialogue is, it has no interaction, no player interaction. Ah. You're just pressing the button and it pops up in a text box and it, it shows, it, it shows what it shows. I got it. There, there's no there, interactivity. There's, there's no, there's no choice here. There's, there's no interaction. You're just watching two people talk. That makes sense. All right. I think we understand. Okay. The best advice for linear dialogue is you need to have a clear idea of the journey you want to take the players on. You need to keep those sequences short, no longer than a minute or two. Okay. Any longer than that, and the player again starts to feel unengaged and then bored. I got it. So you have to constantly give them something. Yes. That makes sense. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next uh, dialogue system. Let us know, chat, if you have any questions or comments about linear dialogue, because I do believe that is what we see most in the RPG Maker games we see in the RM community, correct? Yes, that, as I said, that is the easiest for a developer, developer to, to create and implement. It's right. very easy to code to put in. Okay. Do I have any questions on that? <laughs> There's Kia. God, it is. Yes, Kia. <laughs> okay. I will move on to the yeah. next system. And that's Dialogue Treats. Ooh. This is what most devs we think of when we think of dialogue. Players can choose their responses. If they play a dialogue tree sequence multiple times and choose different responses, they'll often feel the conversation, they'll often find the conversation still progresses in the same game direction. You're creating the illusion of control. Yeah, they're all over the place today, Reverie. <laughs> the pros is players will feel like they have a voice in your game, making them more invested in the experience. Ah. You can also extend the length of gameplay without detracting from the main plot for the players who want to skip past most of the dialogue. Okay. So, in other words, when you have these dialogue trees and a person doesn't want to really work through them, that's okay. You construct a dialogue tree so that no matter what choice is chosen, the main point that you want to get across to move the story forward comes out. I got it. So you're creating, like you say, that illusion of, of choice. Yes. To nudge them in the direction you need them to go for the story to come out. Right. Okay. The cons of this system is definitely more work for the game developers. <laughs> right. There's a lot more coding and programming involved, and you need to be way more organized. Right. Very organized in um, in what you put down for the choices and making sure that your story can go forward no matter what choice the player makes. Okay. Uh, another con, and as I've seen this in games... Bizarre responses to simple questions can kill the overall experience of being in a believable fictional world. Oh, like what are some good examples of that? Or at least one. Okay. So, a an, an NPC bartender says, 
to you. I have I have several uh, drinks that I can present to you. Okay. And your choice is beer, ale, or horsetail. Wow. And, okay, so first of all, you start laughing. Oh my God, horsetail, you serious? Okay, you choose horsetail, and then there's some funny joke or response that happens. <laughs> right. Um, is that really necessary? No. Does that take you out of feeling like you're in an actual uh, pub? Sure. Yeah. So, that was oh, my off-the-cuff example. Right, but oh, what you're basically doing in that example is you're sacrificing integrity for a ha-ha. Yes. Yeah. Rilo brought up something really good just now. And Let's welcome see. to the stream, Rilo, by the way. Okay. In Fallout 4, we're meeting Dance about the Pridwin. He responds to every dialogue option and companion comment with, That's the plan. And McCready's comment is, That thing could level Diamond City if you wanted. Yeah, this breaks the immersion and lore for the Brotherhood of Steel. Yes, it does. It is a... It is a, an NPC response that I will put in there with the bazaar. What does that have to do with going to the Pridwin and meeting with Elder Maxon? Exactly. Nothing. I sometimes add different dialogue choices. It really doesn't affect anything, but one line just to break the conversation. Is that acceptable? Yes, that is acceptable as long as it's not out in uh, Bizarro land. Like a complete it, non sequitur. Yes, it needs to be... It can be funny, but it needs to be a realistic uh, thing that could be in that world. Right. Um, if uh, I, may I toss something in? So, for example, Go ahead you're at the bar. Mm -hmm. You can have beer, you can have ale, or you can have uh, chocobo juice. Chocobo juice. And this, this bar is in the Final Fantasy world. Right. Okay. So... That's acceptable. Okay. So, uh, to kind of, if I may throw this in, and this kind of builds off of what both you said and what came out earlier, as long as it's something that person would naturally say, or that world would naturally have, as long as it's something that would come out if this was a real situation, and not just someone rando non sequiturring, then in your opinion, Teal, it's acceptable. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. So there you go, Reverie. It's it's okay to have different dialogue choices that don't affect anything, as long as it's something that would naturally occur. Right. And I think we should all have the chocobo juice. <laughs> uh, Yorkshire, you're right. Fallout 4 was quite bad for a lot of that. Fallout 4 does not do dialogue advancement of the story stuff, things like that very well at all. No, it doesn't. And honestly, uh... It, it, it commits a whole bunch of other dialogue things, too. Yeah. Uh, Bethesda has a habit of doing that in general, but Fallout 4 is probably their worst. Now, I do have a question before we move on about dialogue trees. The game we're currently playing on Wednesdays, Dragon Quest XI, every time the Luminary is given a choice, it doesn't really affect anything, and generally you have to say yes in order to move the story forward. Is that file under dialogue trees, or is that just a heavily, cle heavily cleverly hidden linear that is just there to trip the player up. That's a cleverly hidden linear. Got it. That's not a choice. Okay. Because even when you choose no, you're still... Um, the, the NPC circles back around and says, Okay, so, are we going to do this or not? Got it. So, yeah, it's not a really... It's not a true choice. That's not a true dialogue free. It's not even the illusion of choice. No. It's just, you're going to have to choose yes. Like uh, the, the Prince Jerkenberry, mm -hmm. who kept slamming his face into the ground until you said yes. Yes. Okay. That 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 is not a good example of a dialogue tree. Got it. No. Ooh. A true dialogue tree would have been, are we going to go to the tree? Yes. So we go to the tree. No. Okay. Instead, you're going to go... You instead you backtrack, go to this other town. Right. You do some stuff, and then somebody says, "Hey, I got something that that needs to. You need to go to the tree for this, so you can get redirected back around." 
But just to simply say no and then have the NPC you're talking to just circle back and, and, and ask their question again. No, that's not a good that's not a good good use of the dialogue tree at all. Got it. And Rilo, it is pretty funny. Um, but yes, it is funny to watch Prince Ferris slap his face to the concrete repeatedly, but it is not actually a choice. It's just forcing you to hit yes when you're ready to stop seeing him kiss the dirt. Right. Okay. Okay. The next example, the next uh, game dialogue system you could use is discoverable or collectible dialogue. Well, that sounds interesting. Also known as environmental storytelling. Ah. Uh... This was your favorite, isn't it, Teal? Yes, it is. <laughs> this system bypasses reliance on NPCs by relaying info through findable items, such as books, scrolls, audio logs, etc. The thing is, not everyone is interested in learning about the entire fictional history of your video game world right. that you've created. Right. But some people are. Mm -hmm. These items can relay large amounts of optional information. So, for example, the books in the Elder Scrolls games. Yes. You open up a book, you read it, and it has a, a bunch of exposition on a certain topic. Right. You can choose to read it or not. Uh, another example is the computer terminals in Fallout games. Those are very good for that. You can actually, uh, you can actually have a complete side story on people you've never, you'll never meet by reading various computer terminals. That's true. That is environmental storytelling. Very true. Very true. The pros to this is that players who choose to can do a deep dive into your world. Hmm. People such as myself who are very lore hungry take every opportunity to grab these collectible dialogue things. Mm -hmm. Books, scrolls, computers, whatever. Right. The con to all this is that your players actually have to find the items. Which there are innumerable games, if I may toss this out, where if you don't find it, you actually are missing out on the story. Yes. So that is a con. You're relying upon the player, the player's exploratory, exploratory skills. That's right. In order to find the story, uh, Nico does make a good comment. Yes, obviously, dialogue choices, no impact or bad. Even if the story goes in a different direction, then loops right back around to where you want it. Yeah. Make the player feel like a choice matters, even if it just colors the opinion of someone for a few lines of dialogue. Something. Uh, but yes, Dark Souls is amazing with its environmental storytelling. I would say probably the best I've ever seen, even more so than the Elder Scrolls and Fallout, because you have to have environmental storytelling in order to understand what's really going on in Dark Souls. So, yeah. Yeah. It, exactly, Nico. That is, that is why the Souls series, other than its difficulty and its requiring of pattern recognition, is so popular because the world is rich and strong without having dialogue-heavy exhibition. So, as a developer, if you're going to put in these uh, collectible dialogue things right. for what we call environmental storytelling, mm -hmm. you're going to need to place them in the player's path. Right. No, you can't have it off in off to the extreme northwest of your map underneath a rock. Mm -hmm. No one's going to look there except people like me. <laughs> You're talking about the vital pieces, not the flavor pieces, right? Correct. Okay. You you need to place them where a player will go. Either on the the main path, okay? I'm going you have to take them through this village, so the these scrolls and books are lying about or along a, a the um an in-game world path at some wow. point this player has to go to this town okay and in this town players are most likely to go where to a shop okay 
So in the shop, you have a book or a scroll lying around. And that book or scroll has something in there that either tells someone else's story or is a bit of information that you have about your world. Okay. Uh, uh, really quickly, uh, Rilo and Reverie also are asking questions. Uh, Let's dialogue see. got a little bit flooded. Uh, Reverie said, is this like Detroit almost human? Or I think it's Detroit become human. Uh, Reverie, could you please explain what you mean by that question? And then Rilo asks, that. would this count like the Fallout having specific dialogues on lock if you pick a specific perk? Uh, in reference to collectible and discoverable dialogue. Yes, and, and I'm, I'm assuming that the specific perk you're, you're probably referring to is the, uh, I can't think of it, <laughs> sorry, the uh, intelligence perk where you can hack terminals. Uh, yes, there are, there are some things, there are some terminals in, in games like in Fallout where if you don't have a high enough hacking, you can't get into that terminal and read the story. Right. Um, I actually frown on that. I think that that's... I, I, I don't like that. Because some of the stuff that comes out of those terminals that you have to have an advanced or expert hacking on is, is really good lore, deep lore stuff. A great example is in Fallout uh, 3. There's a uh, certain terminal, a set of terminals that you can hack, but you have to have expert in hacking. Mm -hmm. And it tells this, this story of these people who used to work for a, a company in Washington, D.C. Okay. Back before the bombs. And the relevance of their story is that there was a lot of corporate corruption and it, it affected... It affected the, uh, the, the the food and water supply to oh, the wow. area. You're not going to know any of that unless you're able to hack those terminals. Right. I don't. That to me, that is. I I, I don't I don't like that. Okay. Rilo is also mentioning this, and this may be more akin to what he's saying. In Fallout Three, there was Child at Heart that opened up new options when talking to children and PCs. What are your thoughts on that, Teal? that hey, if I get this one, I can now talk to children in their language and I'm going to get different options and different dialogues because I'm speaking to them as if I myself was a kid and they trust me as a kid. That is actually a, a good use of what we call of the collectible dialogue because you're actually going up and, and <laughs> I hate to say this, but you're collecting children. <laughs> right, but, you you right. find out certain pieces of information by being able to to uh, t talk to the children, and the children together have a story to tell. Right, and you're not going to know that story unless you can talk to them. Right. Um. Um. It now I do I do like that. Go ahead. But at the same time, at the same time, I have to compare that to the computer terminal that you have to have an expert in to hack in order to read stories right um that is something that if you're going to have something like that in your game you need to keep that to an absolute minimum because what you're doing is you're shutting out players right now the players should be able to choose whether they pursue that uh collectible dialogue tree or not and if you take the choice away from the player that feels like cheating it cheats them out of an experience that they otherwise would have. Right now, Teal, in this regard, and I, uh, this is where I think where Ilo is going, is if you have Child at Heart, you can accomplish the same goal as if you do a persuasion check or a quest. You're not actually doing anything different. You're just accomplishing the same goal differently because you have Child at Heart. In, in that regard, where you don't shut the player out, but you allow them to either circumvent a check or more easily accomplish the same goal that they could accomplish otherwise what are your thoughts about that yeah sure so that gets that gets a, a check mark yes okay but if it shuts them out that's when you say trepidation careful watch yourself 
Correct. Got it. And yes, yeah. uh, also Chad is talking about low intelligence in the original Fallouts, which would require you have your character sure. speaking in grunts or, you know, grog-like guns. Yes, um... That is also, I think, a... But that, that, uh, mm -hmm. now that's okay because you can choose your stats. And if a player has chosen to have a one in intelligence, right. then they are accepting the consequences of their choices. Right. Yes, exactly. So the, the player chose to have a low intelligence, ergo the player is choosing the consequence that comes with it. Right. Got it. Fallout hacking minigame is easy anyway, doesn't want to, doesn't really warrant locking behind a necessary retirement requirement. Yes, exactly. Okay. I agree. We can, uh, we can okay, move on. Okay, let's move on to, uh, the last. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the oh, way, chat, chat, this is great side conversation. Uh, feel free to keep it up. Just, uh, make sure that if someone does ask a question of Teal, that Teal gets a chance to address it. Otherwise, chat away, guys. It's what you do. We love you for it. Oh, we got? Dialogue barks. Bark, bark. That's when a character speaks a line of dialogue without any direct action required from the player. They can come from the main character mm -hmm. or from NPCs. They can also be triggered by specific events taking place or go. be totally random. Yeah. For example, a dialogue bark would be an NPC's angry response when the PC bumps into them. Ooh, yeah. It can be uh, NPCs' comments on the recent string of murders. Ah, yes. Yes. It can be an overheard conversation between NPCs on the monster in the nearby cemetery. Very cool. The pros of this, it makes the game feel very alive. <laughs> Whoa, what's up? Yes, chat, chat, chat. Yep. You can impart important information without telling the players outright. The cons, of course, is that this can get annoying if it's repetitive. Right. And overuse by NPCs will overwhelm the player. Right. Um, saturation. So an example of that would be uh, three or four NPCs start talking at once. Oh, yes. Uh, one is talking to you, two are talking to each other, and the last one is musing aloud to himself, or worse yet, <laughs> singing a song about Ragnar the Red. Uh, <laughs> actually, um, so, actually. yes, my example was uh, in, in Skyrim. Yes, yes. And I can't tell you how many times I've walked to a tavern and just been inundated <laughs> with NPCs barking out stuff at me. Oh, heavens, yes. Um, yeah. Actually, one of the games we're doing our critical play on has some of the best dialogue barks we've ever seen. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. When you're going through the slums. Mm-hmm. That right. is, by far, um, it, it's always just enough. It doesn't repeat itself too much. And uh, it just feels alive. And it moves and changes as you go through the storyline. So, I love it. Um... Griffin did say Outer Worlds has a special ending if you don't go high in intelligence, which is true. I didn't know that, but it's true that there's a lot of games that if you don't have certain things, or you, you stat your character a certain way, you get certain endings. Um, and then Rilo says, the market and Sleeping Dogs did this. All the vendors would talk at once to mm -hmm. fight for your attention. Yes, that and is And you'll end up hearing like every seventh word spoken. Exactly. And that's, that's pretty overwhelming. Especially if this is your first time in the market and you're trying to get your bearings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very annoying. Uh, when we first, when we were doing the beta of the Elder Scrolls Online and we were in Straz Makai for a length of time, Teal, uh -huh. do you remember how every time we'd go near the market, we would hear buying, trading, selling, I have what you need over and over again in different rep repetitive patterns. Yes. And it was non-stop. They actually pulled it back uh, for the commercial, the gold release mm -hmm. of ESO because it was so annoying. So I love barks. I love dialogue barks. But I like it when they're done well and they're done in just the right amount. Yes. Uh, like FF7 Remake. And guys, this does require programming. This is not like, you know, just quick, quick, quick fix. So yeah, that... that uh, brings me to my advice about dialogue barks. Right. 
you want to include a variety of barks and make sure you configure them to avoid overwhelming the player. Right. So yes, configure them so that they don't all start at the same time as soon as you enter the tavern. <laughs> Bethesda does nothing to control their barks. No, the they players don't. just say it when you're close by. Um, honestly, if you're using something like coding or a blueprint or something, it, it, it's a lot easier, but you could even do it in RPG Maker where you would have whatever program has your barks come out and you would have a random wait time. So maybe between, you know, five and eight seconds. You know, a random amount. And have it come out. So it can be done in any engine. Yes, it can. Okay. So to summarize the four types of video game dialogue systems, either give players a choice or make your dialogue brief. There you go. And that does tie into the previous part of the, the lecture. Yes, it does. Very nice. All right, let's get into best practices. Best practices. Of writing your video game dialogue. Your dialogue is valuable, so don't waste it. Typical video games clock in at 20 hours, with some clocking at 60 hours or more. Do you, the developer, want to write 60 hours of dialogue? It <laughs> depends on the developer. <laughs> Plus, having lots of pointless or filler dialogue makes the story uninteresting, the world flat, and players bored or disengaged. And as we talked earlier, a disengaged player is less likely to pick your game back up. Yep. <laughs> Hush, Bubba Hotep. So, when you're writing dialogue, <laughs> ask yourself these questions. Right. Does this piece of dialogue teach the player about the characters? What do they say and how do they say it? Right. Does it give clues about your objectives? Good dialogue makes objectives crystal clear for the players. You want to avoid being long-winded and overly cryptic. Make sure the player can figure out what to do fairly easily. Mm -hmm. We're looking at you, side quests. Ha <laughs> ha. Does the dialogue add depth to your world? In other words, does it aid in establishing context for your players? Right. The way we see the world is impacted greatly by the snippets of conversation we hear, the things that we read and observe, and the things we are told by others. Lastly, no, not lastly, fourth, does this dialogue provide valuable background information? Very important. You want to delete unnecessary information so that only the meat of what needs to be said remains. Backstory is good, but most people just aren't into it. They're, they're not into it as much as you are, the dev. So keep it short and save your long-winded expositions for that discoverable dialogue. And lastly, is this dialogue hilarious, beautiful, or extremely clever? Look, since everyone sees things differently, it's best practice to go over the script of your game with others to get their input. Absolutely. Because what's funny to you may not be funny to anybody else. Experienced that firsthand, and recently too. I have a joke in the Rosenhearts demo that falls flat constantly because only Teal gets it. It's going to go away. Uh, Rilo asked the question, how many, how many hours, hours of dialogue, dialogue Rosenhearts have? We won't know. We won't know until the game's done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's got the dialogue in that game is going to be as verbose as a watered down. Um, who did David Copperfield? Yeah, that guy, the guy who wrote that. Uh, My brain just that skipped. Would... <laughs> My brain literally skipped because I'm Charles on that thing. Dickens. Charles Dickens, yes, it, a lightly <laughs> written Charles Dickens novel. No, um, it's not going to be eighty hours. 80 your hours. Oh well, my gosh! Because. Even though we are emulating the verbose style of the Victorian era, we are not going to subject you guys to Victorian style conversation. 
because they would take 10 minutes to get to a point that we need to get to in one. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Yorkshire. Um, but even there, we can only go so verbose and hide under the shield of, well, this is Victorian so much before players say we don't give a shit. Yep. And we know that. We know that going into it, it's going to be a, a hard balance. And that's something for all of you. If you're writing a story where characters are intentionally a certain way that may irritate your reader or your, your player, you need to find that balance where it's just enough to get the flavor across, but not so much that it pisses everyone off. Not everyone's going to like it, but that's okay. You're not going to please everybody. Um, but don't go and have a 20 minute exposition. Don't do what Xenogears did. Yeah. Where Saiten gives you 20 minutes of dialogue explaining what the Empire and Ramses and everyone is actually doing. That, I don't care. It, you just don't do it. <laughs> God so, damn, Booba Hotep. Six, nine hundred 900 hours. hours. Well, Booba Hotep, you write that dialogue. Yeah, you write it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, to summarize, right, you want to keep what works and toss what doesn't. Exactly. And I cannot emphasize enough: edit, edit, edit. Easier to subtract than it is to add. Yes. We cannot emphasize that enough. Um. Yeah, he is right. At that point, you're just hoping the character dies in the next scene. Oh my gosh, I didn't actually see that. Yes, Kia, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um. It was it kill it. Yeah. Sidebar, Xenogears is one of my favorite RPGs ever in the history of all things. That scene, it's in the underground of, uh, uh, not Shavat, the other one, um, the, the Empire. It nearly killed me, the game for me. I, it nearly killed me. It was 20 to 30 minutes of the characters just talking, and most of it was one character explaining things. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? This is terrible. Oh, yeah. Uh, Griffin says, eight, hey, nine hundred hours, and that's just the intro. <laughs> that's the prologue, <laughs> prior to the opening credits. Okay. Okay, moving on <laughs> moving to the next, next point. <laughs> okay. Make your characters consistent. Mm. There's that voice we talked about, right? Yes. Through voice, action, dress, mannerisms. Mm-hmm. They need to be consistent. So how do you do that? First of all, place yourself in their shoes. How would you act in that situation? Teal. Yes? I apologize for interrupting, but um, I can't emphasize enough. If you, the writer or game developer, can't relate to your character, your readers and players never will. I'm going to take a step back, but I felt compelled to say that. No, that is that is a very good thing. Yes. Say that again for the people in the back. <laughs> if you, the writer or developer, cannot relate to your character, your readers and players will not be able to either. That's right. Uh, another thing you can do is find their personality profile. I've actually done this. Mm -hmm. You can go online and... Uh, use a uh, Myers Briggs or um, the OEM website. Oh uh, yeah, finding personality. Hell, even astrology. <laughs> um, you know, but get an idea of what type of personality they they are, what they have. Yep, and stick with it. Stick with it. You know, is this person, for example? A, an introverted thinking perceiver uh, the Myers or are they an extroverted feeling judger, judging right interestingly enough we did a we did actually do astro astrological signs and Myers Briggs for both Rosenheart sisters so we actually know their personalities pretty well Ikea says give them some dimensions too Yes, it does give them dimensions. Yes. Another thing you can do is draw from real life examples. That's right. Okay. You want to know how a bartender uh, talks, acts? Go to a bar. Right. Watch a bartender. Talk with a bartender. <laughs> um, <sighs> you know, if you want to know what a bartender is like in a, in a pub, go to a pub. There's plenty of them. 
a bar a bartender in a pub will pro will sound differently than a bartender in a five star hotel. Very much so. Yes, personality type is why all Japanese games have blood type. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. That's huge to the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So and they carry that part of their culture over. If you notice here in the States, when they do it, they'll have their Western astrological sign, Leo, Aquarius, etc. Kia's character is such an Aquarius. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. And lastly, get feedback. Yes, sir, Rilo. Show your character, your character's dialogue, the things that they do, where they're at, to, to others. Perhaps, um, let's say that your character is, is an engineer. Get feedback from a real-life engineer. Absolutely. Your character is a teacher. Get feedback from a real-life teacher. Mm -hmm. Would a teacher say that? Would a teacher do that? Yep. Well, a teacher would know. So this is all about making your characters consistent throughout your game. Probably one of the best teachers I've ever seen is Rain Sage in Tales of Symphonia. Mm -hmm. And it's very obvious in Trails of Cold Steel that Sarah Valenstein is not a teacher by trade, but something else. So you can immediately see by their personalities that one is one and the other is another. Yes. And yes, Kia, A-plus squad for the win. <laughs> <laughs> um, before you move on. Yes. Um, gosh, I had something and it was related to all of this. Kind of tying it together. Oh, well, I forgot it. I'll probably remember during the final part. Uh, keep putting pieces of people I know meant to characters. Me. Thank you, Kia. You just reminded me. Thank you. Okay, so this is straight from the mouth of Neil Gaiman okay. um, during one of his uh, workshops that he did. As a writer, you have to experience life in order to write about it. If you want to know how people in Italy are going to act, go to Italy. If you want to be able to accurately portray the Amazon jungle, go to the Amazon jungle. Now, obviously some things you can't and can't do. You can't go to Mars, you can't go, you know, rotate around uh, Beetlejuice, etc. But a lot of the things that you can do when it comes to people, which influences dialogue, you can do. Which means you have to go outside and meet people. You have to talk to people. You have to watch. Watching a person, watching people interact and do their thing. And I don't mean some weird spy glass <laughs> binoculars through the window, so I'm not giving you guys the ability to... <laughs> I'm not promoting peeping. Um, but go out and see how people act, you know? Mm -hmm. Don't don't base your interactions of your characters on rom-coms and Netflix. Real people don't act that way. No, they don't. Watch how real people act and then put that into your character. And that's what I mean by Kia saying, putting pieces of people they know into characters they make. Mm -hmm. That is A-plus Kia, 100% what you should do. Um, every character Teal and I have ever made has a little sliver of someone we know or have known inside them. Who says you can't go to Mars was there last <laughs> week. Well, that's you, Bubba Hotep. Okay. Yep. Just basically go outside. Go outside. You can't okay. write about a world you're not a part of. Okay, the next tip is make your dialogue unique. Yep. Please, 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 for the love of all that's holy, avoid cliches. <laughs> Notice cliches, not tropes, right? Yes. Cliches. Right. And here's another uh, thing you can do to try to make it unique. Come up with three or five different ways to say that line, the same line that you're writing. <laughs> so you can write it one way. Yeah. And then come up with uh, several other ways to write it. I guarantee you that you're gonna you're gonna pick a, a another way rather than the original way of writing that line, right? Because you're looking for uniqueness. You you are. Um, it goes back to the earlier part of the workshop when we talked about not saying the same thing over and over again the same way. Right. You don't want your players to get bored. Don't look at your boy boy Bahotep. <laughs> so creepy. Yeah, don't say it's creepy. Show us why it's creepy. Exactly. <laughs> this is this is actually really important. It's a small slide with just two pieces of text, but how often, Teal, have we seen something that is either cliche, 
not tropish, but taken to the cliche level. Yes. Or how often have we seen the same thing said the same way repeatedly? Yep. And that is outside of just our RPG Maker Let's Plays. That's in general. And it's it's boring. And again, I can't I can't stress this enough. If you bore or disengage your audience, whether they be your reader or your player, they may play your game, but they'll be less likely to pick it up and finish it. And your ultimate goal should always be to get them to go from start to finish. Can you give an example for both points? Sure. Yeah. Do you want to do it, honey, or do you want me to? Um, I can't think of cliches off the top of my head. I'm right. sorry. Okay. Um, big dumb barbarian with an axe. Grognak. The barbarian. I just took the right off fallout. That's a cliche. It's it's not, not even Conan the Barbarian, who it's all based off of, is Grognok. Urgh, Grognok smash! You can quote me on that. Um, uh, the uh, skinny, frail mage. The, um, if we're going to anime style, the less than almost unclothed elf archer. These are things that have been done all the time and are taken to a cliche. A cliche level, um, is when you take something to its highest level of of tropishness. So a trope is, you know, strong warrior. The Sundari character, exactly, Kia. So, trope, strong warrior. Cliché, big muscle-bound stupid barbarian who wears the fur of the animal he killed with his bare hands and he has and a big goes, old axe. Ugh, grunt, Ugh. grunt, grunt, grunt. His, yeah. his dialogue is grunt, grunt, groan, right. grunt, grunt, groan. That's a cliché. A trope is just a strong male warrior with a two-handed weapon. You can do the trope. And some tropes are brilliantly done. Conan the Barbarian is still a really good trope. And I've seen imitations of it that are great. The cliche makes it uninteresting. Now, as far as the second one, finding ways to say the line. Okay. You got this one? I got this All one. All right, go for it, Teal. Okay, so you originally write down for this little boy in PC. He says, I hate gels. Try instead. Jails make me sick. A jail? Really? Wow. Yeah. So we now also have learned two things. One, different ways to say the line. And also, Teal's uh, Jota voice is A+. <laughs> um, but I want to draw attention back here to chat. Rilo says, all the skill and preparation in all the realms will still fail to protect you from the ambassador of Lady Luck bearing the mark of a fool is a fancy way of saying all the skill won't defend you from a lucky moron. Rilo, that is brilliant. Yeah. Very well done, sir. And Kia says, tired, rage barbarian woke. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, rage barbarian. Urgh, that's so cliche. But the interesting version is rage barbarian is a banker who gets pissed if you can't write a deposit slip. Kia, I just had the strongest ever Conan the Librarian from UHF in my life, and yes. I love you for it, Kia. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, if you've ever seen UHF, we can be friends. It does, doesn't it, Reverie? It's Gandalf. <laughs> All the floors of the world. Blah, blah, blah. Actually, it's kind of funny. When Gandalf talks in the books, my mind turns off, but when he speaks in the movies, I'm actually paying attention because he's inflected so well. Um... Yeah, Gandalf's dialogue is actually way too grandiose. In the books. In the books. Yes. The books. It's In, in the movies, it's much better. Um, but anyway, yeah. let us continue. All right. <laughs> Create anticipation with your video game dialogue. Yeah. As the player progresses through your game, working towards a major moment... You can heighten their emotional experience using the game's dialogue. The promise of an unraveled mystery, a challenging foe, or an incredible reward right. can be a big motivating factor for players. So, start dropping those hints early in your game's dialogue. There you go. So, really, I mean, with this one, it's use the dialogue the same way you would drop clues in a mystery. In fact, yes. if I'm not mistaken, Teal, aren't most of your favorite mysteries 
which I believe are Hercule Perot and Miss Marple, yeah. aren't they almost all dialogue driven? They are dialogue driven. Agatha Christie was a genius when it came to uh, her dialogue writing. And one of her hallmarks was creating anticipation. Right. So, two things there. One, you should read, Ag you should read Agatha Christie. Hercule Perot, Hercule Perot and Miss Marple are two of the best detectives ever. I like them more than Sherlock Holmes. Um, second... When you write your dialogue and you're trying to build that anticipation, like Teal said, think like a mystery writer. Yes, exactly. You're, you're dropping hints and clues through the dialogue throughout your story, and it builds up to your end game. There you go. Whatever your end game is. And I think, Teal, you and Kia just had a connection moment. <laughs> That is uh, your favorite author, correct, honey? Yes. Agatha Christie yeah. is my favorite author. Yes. yes. So, looking at uh, Dragon Quest Eleven, Dragon Quest Eleven, you start getting hints about the importance of the, the world tree, Yggdrasil. Right. From the very beginning. Right. And these hints lead you to believe just how important this, this tree is and how much it's tied into the world and all of its people. So... It comes as no surprise to you, the player, that when it gets destroyed, the world goes to shit and hell. Spoiler alert. And a whole lot of people die. <laughs> right. Because right. the tree is destroyed. Right. And you got that from all the little dialogue clues and hints exactly. throughout the whole first act. And what they've also done is they've cleverly laid seeds that now Teal and I don't know where it's going about the Luminary, the reincarnation of the old Luminary Erdwin, Erdwin's best friend Morgant, and the fact that there's some way, somehow, that the bad guy Mordegon was able to, spoiler alert, steal the Luminary's hmm. power. Mm -hmm. So now, we have created, the, the, the developers of the game have created a preconception hmm. in Act 1, and then challenge it at the very end of Act 1, and now in Act 2, we have to discover why. Um, and all that was done through dialogue. Dialogue itself. It was strictly character dialogue. Yes. You didn't read this in a book. You didn't have a narrator voiceovering. You had, you had NPCs mm -hmm. talking to you, telling you this stuff. And that's the reason why, regardless of our frustration with the game, we keep coming back to it because it keeps re-roping you back in even after it pulls a silly cliche. Uh, Yorkshire asked the question, do you like them more than Columbo? Yes. Columbo, as good as Columbo was, yeah. I still prefer Agatha Christie's. Now, for me, it's Hercule Poirot followed by Columbo, followed by Miss Marple, followed by Holmes. But I... Poirot is still my favorite. I like Columbo because he looks like he doesn't know what he's doing, and he knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah. But I like Poirot more because he's like a bloodhound, when he's little gray cells, I, I, I love David Suchet's way of doing it. Uh, when he gets on the hunt, it's kind of like watching a magnet just go right for the kill. It's it's yeah. rough. Anyway. Okay. Here's my next point. Yeah. Uh, Reverie says, uh, halfway through Act 3 tragedy. Oh, okay. Yeah, halfway through three act tragedy. Three act tragedy. Yes. yes. <laughs> Very good story. Yes. Very good story. All right. So here's the next point. You want to give quality dialogue to NPCs. Yes. And what quality dialogue is not is times are tough. <laughs> Sorry. I, I I'm gonna harp on that till till the, the cows come home. Because I absolutely couldn't believe that that was in a, in a real AAA video game. It was. Times are tough. Even though it was a nod to an old web comic, it had no place. No, it didn't. So please give good quality dialogue to NPCs. Yes. And please understand that sometimes your one-offs can be more popular than your planned dialogue. Skyrim, despite all of its problems, has some great moments of dialogue. 
It will forever be known as I used to be an adventurer like you that I took an arrow to the knee. <laughs> yeah. So watch yourself because you may actually Please. create the greatest meme ever. You Wire want to stuff. enhance your player experience with a living, engaging world. You want to improve player navigation, the story, side quests, etc. And by doing that, your game will be taken more seriously. And this is even if your game is a comedy, correct, Teal? Even if it's a comedy. I've seen really good comedy games. Yes. And I've seen terrible games. <laughs> Some of the, if you've ever checked out Hawk playing any of the King's Quest games, those can be a little on the painful side. Yeah, Rilo, exactly. Why are times tough? Ah, uh, there you go. How are times tough? What is making it tough for this guy? What is it making? Why? Yeah. How is it tough for this guy? <laughs> These are things we want to know. Right. Throwaway lines. Don't do them. Mm -mm. Like Teal said in a previous slide, even your random convos made by a random person on the side, they may not have meaning to exactly what the hero is doing, but they have meaning to that character. Unless a person is being silly, nobody says something just to have words come out of their mouth. No. Exactly. The villagers are paying out of the ass in the king's tasks. What the hell is he doing with it? Thank you, Rilo. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Conversational threads are the most beautiful thing in the world. And if you could actually make your game so that when you walk by the guy saying times are tough, his best friend asks why, and he launches into a few comments about taxes, and the other person responds with, where's that money going? You just engaged your player in a part of your game. That's amazing. Yes, it is. We need more of that. Sorry for uh, jumping in so much there. I felt compelled to answer about the times You're are fine. tough part. All right. And lastly, you want to write your dialogue with your audience in mind. I Know your target audience. Yes. Okay. Are they adults? Are they teens? Are they children? Are they engineers? Artists? Other writers? Mm-hmm. You need to know who your target audience is. Who are you writing for? Good piece of advice. Your dialogue must be relatable and understandable by your target audience. Yep. Those two go hand in hand. Know your target audience and relate to your target audience. And please avoid insensitive or inappropriate words and phrases or ideas. Uh, now, Teal, may I ask for a clarification point on that? On number three. May I ask for a clarification? Uh, yes. Okay. You're saying in, in a sensitive or inappropriate for shock value or just because, not because it matches how the character actually relates to the world. For example, the elven racism in Dragon Age. Mm-hmm. That is acceptable if inappropriate comments like knife ears, which is obviously a racial slur, is given in that context. Yes. I see. So, you want to make sure that what you're saying works within and matters within the world. You're not just throwing out things to be, forgive the air quotes, edgy. Right. That makes perfect sense. And it's always, it's always very difficult when you act, when you have a character in a story who is has a, a an illness right whether it, it's physical or mental right it's it's difficult to write about that to write it sensitively right and that's why you're going to need several pairs of eyes to make sure that you're not inadvertently insulting mm -hmm. making fun of right or spreading misinformation exactly Yes, it's a video game. Yes, it, it's entertainment. But real world people are playing your game. Right. And um, you need to be aware of hot button topics. And try to keep those out of your games. If you must touch upon one, then you're going to need to get assistance to make sure that you're not crossing that line exactly because your game becomes a platform 
and that platform can cause harm. I think the best example I've ever seen, Teal, is uh, Hellblade, Sinua's Sacrifice, mm -hmm. where the developers actually hired psychiatrists to work with them on um, schizophrenia and hearing voices. Okay, yes. So that the character of Sinua, who, for lack of a better term, has schizophrenia, she hears voices from the very beginning of the game. It's done in a way that is respectful and correct and ultimately gives the player an experience you'll never forget. By the way, if you ever play that game, play it with headsets. Do not play it without... Put your headsets on to play that game. <laughs> it is amazing and terrifying at the same time. Yeah. There are always better ways to make a character look like an asshole. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There, there, yes, yes, there is. Exactly. Well, what I like about the way Dragon Age handles its elven racism is that they show how systemic it is. It's so much a part of human society that some people are that way and don't even realize it. And then you have your assholes. Um, Logain's a great example. Mm -hmm. Mactir Logain was the best uh, character in the Dragon Age series, especially Origin. The way he was presented, he was a nationalist who truly loved his country, but did terrible things. He was a racist, but he didn't hate them just because he hated them because it was what you did. It was uncomfortable to watch some of the scenes Loghain was in. Yes. But he was a very powerfully written character. And yes, Senua's Sacrifice is an amazing game. Hello, Brother Caspa. Welcome to the stream. We are getting near the end, but uh, feel free to hang out. We are talking about uh, writing dialogue within games and stories. Please continue, my I dear. do want to circle back yeah. to give an example of, of course. Uh, your target audience yes. and being relatable to them. Yes. Uh, uh, some examples are, if you're writing for a younger audience, you want to avoid inappropriate language. Oh, yes. You know, you're, you're writing for, uh, let's say you're writing for, uh, for for tweens. Okay. Please don't drop the F-bomb. Right. Mm -mm. Right. For an older audience, you can explore deeper concepts. Right. So that's that's what... In a nutshell, that's what I mean by relating to your target audience, making sure that they're going to understand what you're doing. Exactly. We have this uncomfortably difficult to categorize group now called YA, mm -hmm. and that just changed a lot of the rules because it used to be children, tween, and adult. Yes. Now it's not. Now it's not. YA has expanded its age range, and it, it includes anything from a... Uh, 13 to the 23 right and all right hey thank you for the follow brother casper much appreciated um uh, ya is a young adult right and the best example of ya i can give you that's very pop that was very popular at one time is the twilight series that is it um city of bones was also popular mm -hmm. um uh, YA is typically written about um, teen characters right. from their point of view. Right. And it involves uh, some sort of romance or love triangle mm -hmm. and a supernatural, mostly it's a supernatural situation. Uh, a lot of YA nowadays is, is supernatural, but I've seen YA and just strictly real world settings too. It, uh, it takes place in a college. Right, and no, Yorkshire, uh, not just for girls. No, it's not just for girls, it's uh, for guys, too. It's for guys, too. Uh, the Hunger Games has no supernatural, but it does have a love triangle. Yes. It does have life or death struggles, and it's very good. YA means young adult, yeah. And it's, um, Hunger Games is amazing. Yeah, but again, but, you have a, a teenage protagonist. Right, Katniss. It's from, from her point of view, yep. and she's the hero. She's the hero of the story. Right. Uh, another series uh, that but you may not be as familiar with is the Wicked Lovely series by Melissa Moore. Right. That's that is classic YA. You have a teen character who is the 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 first book is from her point of view and she's she's the savior of the fairy world. <laughs> she's the summer queen. So and she she you knows she she's all very special and stuff and then there's 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 guys who are in love with her and right. um you've got a villain who wants to stop her and that that is typical ya 
Right. Um, now, you don't just have to have female main characters. In oh, fact, no. one of the most popular book series of our generation that became one of the most popular movie series of our generations is technically YA and fe features a main hero male, and that's Harry Potter. Yep, Harry Potter. The Harry Potter series is technically YA. Now, you can build something and say the last two books are not, especially the Deathly Hallows, but it is at its core YA. He's a young adult, starts as a child, and goes all the way to about 17, and uh, he is the chosen one, and that's a very big trope in yes, YA. Yes, the chosen one, yes. He's the chosen one. You are the hero, the heroine. You are you are the special. Right, the special. <laughs> And uh, you are very welcome, Brother Casper. Hope you enjoy it. We do uh, our critical plays of games on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Okay. And yes, Hunger Games Rilo is an amazing series, even though it is easier to read than some of the more complex adult books. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoyed it more than I enjoyed the movies. And the movies are good. Yeah, because I'm the chosen one. Chosen mm -hmm. one. So, right. um, that's, I think that's pretty much it for for this yeah. right dialogue with right. the audience in mind. Right. Let me move on to the last slide. <gasps> and I just want to conclude by saying that the best thing you can do for creating video game dialogue is to do it. Yes. Okay. Just like Steele said with, with uh, writing novels. Yep. You need to just, just to practice, 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 because the more you write, the better you're going to become. And that's, that's just... That's just how it is. That That is the reality of writing dialogue in anything. That's right. You've just got to keep writing. Every day. Um, even if I'm not writing a book or, or dialogue for a game, I'm writing one of the articles for the tabletop system we're working on. So I try to lay down 500 to 1,000 words a day, no matter what. Right. It is the only way you're going to be good at it. It is, it's a, it's a skill set and you got to practice at it. Fun fact, if you think about the Hunger Games, it will far Yes, it does. Yeah. Most YA worlds actually don't function well outside of their narrative. But that's okay, because you're there for the fantasy. You're not really there for the world. No. I mean, I'm sorry, Harry Potter fans, the Wizarding World wouldn't work. We're too smart. All the obfuscate and obliterate charms in the world would not... That damn rainstorm scene at the end of the first... Uh, Fantastic Beasts. Mm -hmm. I called bullshit on that in the theater. Of course. <laughs> you should have heard him snort into his popcorn. <laughs> it's the only time I've ever called bullshit on Rowling, by the way. <laughs> uh, anyway, yes. But yes, in YA, and especially the fantasy YA, the supernatural YA, yeah. um, you know, the, the worlds are, are fantastic and, and unbelievable, but yes. they're fantasy. Right. The, the audience has decided as a whole to give writers of YA a bit of a pass on world being realistic. Right. They don't get the same pass to adult writers. By the way, you don't have to say something's YA just because your character's a child or a teenager. However, you have to make sure that when you're writing it, that you let people know this is not YA just because it has a minor character as one of the protagonists. Before YA became a thing, uh Books were divided into fantasy and science fiction. That's it. And your characters were anywhere from, you know, age 12 on up to, you know, 42. <laughs> you know, it ran the gamut. Right. What united all the, 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 the books under one genre is how they were presented. 100% Rilo. Stephen King has children characters mm -hmm. in his stories, and his stories are adult. I it. would never ever peg that as a child or YA book. No, it's it, not. It is still one of the most horrific stories I've ever read. And the first half, all the characters are like 12, 13. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, it's not about the age of your characters. It's about what you're presenting and how it's being presented. And it has thrown some people who are writing and have been writing since the 70s and 80s for a loop. And they've had to adjust. But it's exceedingly popular and it sells. So, it's not going away. Um, we got a little bit off topic. Uh, we back did. to what Teal was talking about. Yes, continue to write every day. So if you're if you're a game developer listening to this, whether it be live or VOD, practice writing your character's dialogue, even if it's a drabble. A drabble is 500 words. Do it every day. If you're listening to this and you want to be a writer, uh, whether it be screenplays, scripts, full-length novels, or short stories, write something every day. Steel writes every day. So if you want to write, you write. 
every yes. day. Um, make it a part of your activity. You know, do it to wind down. Do it to wind up. Do it during your lunch break. I think it was either Neil Gaiman or I think it was Neil Gaiman who said, "Write, write, write some more. Write until your finger. Write until your keys break. Then take a pencil and start writing until your pencil turns into a stub. Then start using your blood until your fingers are nubs and keep writing some more." In other words, if you want to get good at writing, guess what you got to do? You got to write. That's all there is to it. So we're going to open this up to, I guess, last minute questions. Last minute questions, all guys. Right. Open this, it up. This was a very robust topic. Uh, we split bad. it up between uh, two mediums, uh, books and video games, but the concepts are basically the same. Across the board. It's all the same. Whether it be, uh, no matter what it is, if you have characters speaking... You can apply something from this workshop. Yes. Lecture. Presentation. <laughs> Boo Boo Hotep, you're not nothing. You're just painting your model right now. <laughs> Thank you, Reverie. That means a lot. That really does. Um, we, we, Teal and I, when we pick these topics, we try to choose the ones that we feel are going to give the most bang for the buck, as the case may be. Uh-huh. And we wanted this one to hit hard. Now... Someone made a comment earlier. This was a lot to take in, and we acknowledged that going in. We knew that this was going to be one of the harder written ones. Wait till we get to color theory. <laughs> you guys are learning. Hopefully, if it's helping, that's all that matters to us. Right, honey? That's right. The thing is, dialogue is the best way to pull your players in and engage them. Completely. That's why it's so very important to get yes. it right. Very much so. Excuse me. Oh, very cool. Cool, Reverie. I'm glad we could help you out. I really am. I hope we were able to answer your questions. And to everyone else out there who's been listening, I hope this has been able to help you guys. I hope your writing, especially for your dialogue, improves. And if that's the case, let us know. Uh, either let us know on our Discord, or if you're watching this on YouTube, please We have a, a channel on our Discord yeah. that's specifically for writing. We call it the Writing Workshop. Yes. And you can jump in there and ask people questions or answer people's questions uh -huh. critique works that sort of thing that's what that's for yes is for for people to put their heads together and and uh, just get better at, at writing yep we have some amazing writers uh and just developers in general who show up on that channel all the time and uh they're able to offer really comprehensive advice um, there are other streamers out there who are also really good at this. Um, Hawk Zombie's a professional writer, so you can always pick his brain if he's not busy uh, beating his head over an RPG Maker game. But the reality is this. On our Discord channel, we have a channel specifically for writing workshops. Please utilize it. We're always there to help. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit a comment. Let us know if this helped you, and let us know if you have any questions. Anything else on your Anything end? Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> Polling the audience. All right. <clears throat> then I think unless we have something pop up, we'll call it in just about a minute. Okay. Um, we are going to continue Dragon Quest XI on Wednesday and Final Fantasy VII Remake, which may be the end of the game. We'll see on we'll Thursday. We'll see on Thursday. Not sure. And then Friday will be our AMA, uh -huh. which on friday if you've been following the interesting story of our tabletop adventure we can talk about that on friday unless if you are a slime tastic supporter that's someone who is a tier two twitch subscriber or ten dollars or more on patreon you get to be a part of our weekly round table tomorrow at five central six eastern and we will talk about our tabletop adventure then and how things went so you get a sneak peek plus you get a bunch of other perks uh but that's always on Tuesdays. Always on Tuesdays. Right. Otherwise, Fridays for the AMA peeps. The dialogue is a weakness. There you go. Um, I'm glad this was able to help, Griffin. All right. Shall we call it, my love? Let's go ahead and call it. All right. This has been a great stream. We have been able to really help. Uh, Boobo Hotep says, awesome, bloody good stream. So we'll get the slime of approval <laughs> we there. We have the slime culture. Uh, you are very welcome, Reverie. Uh, so just a reminder that on Wednesday, we will do a critical play of Dragon Quest Eleven, And on... Thursday, we will do a critical play of Final Fantasy VII Remake. Maybe the end of the game. And lastly, Friday is our Ask Us Anything AMA. So, if you like what you saw, leave the smack down the like button below. Subscribe to our channel. Consider supporting us on Patreon. Connect with us on our Facebook, Twitter, Discord. And we'll see you in the next video. See you next time.
Someone new. 